Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Welcome to Policy and Rights, the show about government policy and human rights. Welcome back to Policy and Rights here in Depictions Media Radio. I'm your host, Michael Cloggs. And in today's show, we're going to be listening to the UN Security Council as they come up with um, presentations about, again, what, what is happening in Ukraine and the need to stop the war in Ukraine, not only for the health of the Ukrainian people, but but for global health, for global peace, and for global stability. We're also going to hear um, from an expert on um, the global food crisis, um, Atif Hussain of the World Programming uh, Chief Economist, he is going to give a press briefing also to to the through the UN um, and talk about the economics behind uh, what is happening with uh, food crises and also how the war between um, Ukraine and Russia is affecting the food supplies around the world with what is able to be shipped out um, from both of those countries. Um, And as you'll hear in one of his statements that there is little to nothing being shipped out of the Ukraine, which when they're a major supplier of grains to most of the world, that starts to become a problem. And in developed countries, it means that Grain-based products, of course, are going to become more expensive. And in underdeveloped countries, it means food shortages and malnutrition. With that, I'd like to introduce our guest, um, uh, Arif uh, Hussein, who is the chief economist of the uh, World Food Program, and Rain Paulson, who's been a frequent guest here uh, from the FAO, who's the Director of Emergencies. Are you gentlemen on? Yes, we are. We see you. Great. Uh, So I think uh, Arif will let you go first, and um, then we'll we'll move on. Thank you. Thank you, Stan. Uh, Hello, everybody. So, so I'm just going to very quickly present the, the results of what is called the Global Report on Food Crisis. Uh, it is a report which is essentially produced by about 17 different partners, you know, from the UN, from development agencies, from humanitarian agencies, from regional bodies. Uh, and, and, uh, and they look at the, the, the situation, the, the, the hunger situation of the world, but from the acute food insecurity side. Uh, this report is done by what is called the Food Security Information Network uh, for the, uh, the uh, big body, which is the, the global ne- network against food crises. Um, one thing to note about this report is that this doesn't cover the entire world, but it focuses on 53 countries uh, in 2021, and then it also provides a forecast for about 41 countries going forward. So this is not the whole picture, but it is a subset of of a picture on which there is big consensus. Uh, In terms of of the numbers in 2021, 
In these 53 countries, there were more than 193 million people who were in crisis or worse level of food insecurity. Over half a million people in four countries were in catastrophe or famine. About 39 million people were in emergency in 36 countries, meaning a step away from famine. And then an additional 133 million people in 36 countries were in crisis level of food insecurity. Now, this obviously, you know, from year to year, the numbers of countries which we cover kind of go up. Uh, but we have been doing this for the last six years. So when we look at the trend, what we find is that hunger since 2016 has been consistently going up, acute hunger, crisis level hunger, meaning that in 2016, we had about 94 million people who were in crisis or worse hunger conditions. In 2021, that, was, that number was 180 million people. That is a 92% increase in, in just six years. Now, other thing which is, which is, which is uh, important to, to, to note is that these 570,000 people who are in famine were in four countries in 2021, meaning in Ethiopia, in South Sudan, in Yemen, and in Madagascar. Of these four countries, Three were purely conflict, meaning Ethiopia, South Sudan, and Yemen. And Madagascar famine in 2021 was related to climate, climatic shocks. But by the way, we've never had 570,000 people in catastrophe in any of the six years that this report has been uh, produced. Another interesting fact is that in six countries, there are at least 12 million people who are in crisis or worse food security situation. This is like the top one, Democratic Republic of Congo, Afghanistan, Ethiopia, Yemen, Northeast Nigeria, and Syria. Now coming very quickly to what are the root causes? What is the, what is the reason why? And the biggest by far reason is man-made conflict. Of these 193 million people in countries, 72% meaning are, are, uh, are in this situation because of conflict. Another 30 million people in 21 countries are suffering because of economic shocks, mostly driven by COVID and its consequences as well. And then another 23.5 million people in eight countries are suffering because of climatic shock. So these three reasons, if I can say it again, conflict, climate, and COVID-related economic consequences are some of the biggest reasons why we are seeing such levels of food insecurity and hunger in the world. A couple other things. Uh, there are about... 51 million internally displaced people globally, okay? Of which 45 million, almost all, are in 24 countries which are affected by food crises. So there is a really strong correlation between conflict, displacement, and food insecurity. And, and the top six over there, again, Syria, Afghanistan, DRC, Yemen, Ethiopia, and Sudan. Then we also looked at the children. And what we find is that in these 53 countries, there are about 26 million children who are severely wasted, who are wasted and severely wasted. By the way, 11 million of those, 11.5 million of those are only in four countries. So. And those countries, again, are Ethiopia, Afghanistan, Sudan, and Yemen. So you can see the trend that a lot of food insecurity, a lot of conflict, a lot of displacement, a lot of child malnutrition, it is concentrated in few countries, but with very, very big numbers. Now, I mentioned that, you know, this report also looks at, uh, at, at the forecast, meaning for 
year 2022. And that's really scary because just in 41 countries around the world, 181 million people are forecasted to be in crisis or worse situations in 2022. And by the way, this doesn't account for Ukraine or what its, its consequences beyond the borders of Ukraine. Now, very quickly as World Food Program, as you may know, we are present in about 80 plus countries. So we keep an eye on all those 80, 81 countries and our figures even before Ukraine for those 81 countries were already 276 million people. This had risen from about 150 million post uh, uh, pre-COVID. And we have also analyzed, you know, what would be the impact of Ukraine crisis on global food insecurity. And what we see is that we expect another 47 million people to become, try, you know, be, become acutely food insecure, meaning in crisis or worse situation. So altogether, that puts us to about 323 million people around the around the world. Now, what we are we are. What we are saying is that as, 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 as World Food Program, that we need to assist these people. Uh, now we are planning to, to reach as many as 145 million people this year. For that, we continue to need financing, but also in many parts, sustained humanitarian access. I will stop here. Thank you. Now we turn the floor over to Mr. Paulson. Thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity. And as you've heard, um, Arif has uh, laid out all of the numbers in this uh, sixth edition of the of the global report. So let me maybe just build on that by focusing on a, a small number of uh, concerns. Um, the first of which uh, relates to um, the increase in uh, acute food uh, security as we've documented it, and this steady progression that Arif was mentioning since 2016. Um, one other key indicator to complement what Arif just shared, uh, if over those six years you look at the percentage of the population analyzed who are in acute food insecurity, that has also gone up from just over 11% in 2016 to just over 22% uh, uh, in 2016. Uh, 21. So, I mean, there's a lot of numbers here, but the message that comes quite clearly through all of this is food security, acute food insecurity has been getting progressively worse over those years. Obviously, that's the first of our concerns. But our second concern related to this as well then uh, relates to funding flows and financing. Arif was mentioning what the World Food Program uh, requires. I'll, I'll say something about FAO in a second. In a macro sense, uh, at the same time as you have these six years of worsening acute food insecurity, what we see in 2020, the last year we've done this analysis, uh, is a five-year low in funding for uh, food crisis uh, context. And here I'm talking specifically then about funding for um, uh, food security activities, funding for the types of activities that uh, the WFP does, FAO does, Importantly, also funding for nutrition uh, work that uh, uh, entities are going into. So in 2021, there was 8.1 billion US dollars collectively available uh, for emergency work in these settings. That's 25% lower than in 2017. Obviously, then, these trends of increases in acute food insecurity as documented through uh, the global uh, report and the numbers you've just heard. Uh, matched with a declining global trend in funding is of huge uh, concern. Um, and the third piece I want to mention on this, and uh, Arif touched on it, but it is really important to underscore, this analysis and even these early projections for next year, when already we're seeing that in 41 uh, of the countries for which we have data as we're looking into 2021, there are already uh, an additional 5 million people uh, in acute food insecurity beyond the current projections. Uh, as we look at all of these numbers, that analysis is not yet factoring in uh, the consequences of uh, the war in Ukraine on global food security. So we're facing a, a significant challenge. Uh, our concern and our priority as FAO is uh, quite frankly that we need to, um, we need to redouble 
investment in uh, famine prevention. We need to redouble uh, investment in uh, agriculture as part of uh, famine uh, prevention. You've heard the headline numbers. Uh, just to say that two thirds of all of these uh, individuals who are experiencing acute food insecurity are located in rural areas. These are individuals who live and rely on agriculture for uh, their survival. One other quick statistic uh, at the risk of putting too many out there, but funding for agriculture in particular, uh, when we did our analysis uh, over the last five years was just 5% of what went into overall uh, food security. So this is something that does need to be uh, addressed as part of the overall uh, response. Uh, the FAO is uh, urgently asking for 1.5 billion US dollars now, right now, uh, to support 50 million of the world's most food uh, insecure uh, people. We're on the ground, uh, we're delivering uh, in Ukraine, in elsewhere, uh, and that's uh, our priority and, uh, and our uh, commitment. Maybe the last comment I'd make, and uh, then uh, happy to uh, see what questions may come in. Uh, as we held the release event today for the global report, there were a lot of, I think, really important reflections that come through also in the, in the analysis on the need for working across humanitarian uh, development and uh, peace uh, pillars. Um, if we're seeing this worsening trend year on year uh, and the decline in funding, it's also telling us that we have to work differently. We know how to do it, uh, but we do need support uh, and attention to drive forward programming in uh, the nexus space if we're going to address root causes. And that's really probably the biggest rallying cry that comes out of this analysis. But let me maybe uh, stop there uh, and revert back to uh, the chair for any questions that colleagues may have. Over for questions. Uh, first question goes to Edie Lederer. Uh, thank you very much on behalf of the United Nations Correspondents Association for doing this briefing. Um, I have two questions. First, um, you said that the impact of the ongoing war in Ukraine has not yet been factored in. Uh, can you give us any indication of um, how of the impact you believe it will happen, particularly on um, countries that are already facing severe insecurity in food? Secondly, in terms of the financing issue, um, Obviously, uh, COVID was one issue in recent years, but um, in that decline from 2017 to 2021, um, what other issues do you see that were key to the loss of significant financing, and how are you going to recoup that? that um, money and reach um, the very significant funding that you need for this year. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, Paul, would you like uh, I can go first if you want. Uh, right? Go ahead, please. Yeah. Um, so, so just on the on the, the the increased number because of the Ukraine crisis, uh, as World Food Program, we did the analysis, and we tried to to essentially look at how many more people would be affected uh, because of the war in Ukraine in terms of higher food prices, higher fuel prices, and also inflation, uh, transmitting from global level to different countries. And our estimate or our projection is that it would be an additional uh, 47 million people who would be acutely food insecure because of this crisis now. Uh, there are also many other uh, numbers which are which are out there, which are also essentially in the same 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 um, same um, let's say range. The, the other thing I wanted to say was that it is not only that 
the numbers are increasing, but it is also impacting us as World Food Program because our costs are going up. Our costs of assisting people are going up. To put that in perspective, uh, our cost from 2019, meaning before COVID, to today have gone up by $71 million more per month. This $71 million is enough to feed both with food and cash about 3.8 million people every month, per month. So it is a significant impact on people, but also on the ability of humanitarian agencies and other in agencies in order to help. On your second question, I would just say that, you know, this war is not happening in a vacuum. We were already dealing with the consequences of COVID in terms of people's reduced incomes. Even food and fuel prices before Ukraine war were already at a 10-year high for food and seven-year high for fuel. So, so what you're seeing this this crisis is essentially more fuel on a fire which was already burned and burning hot. If I could maybe add to what Arif has uh, shared, that um, when, when you look at the report, and I hope you do get a chance to look at the details, you'll see, amongst other things, that there's, uh, there's a core set of 19 countries that have been uh, uh, consistently at the heart of this analysis over the six years. There's a larger group of countries, as Arif mentioned, but they constitute um, between 70 to 80 percent of uh, the total acutely food insecure population that's uh, analyzed. The fact that those countries are there year on year, so our analysis spreads back six years, these crises go back even before then uh, in most cases. Um, you know, if you ask the question around, well, what's been happening in terms of funding trends, I do think it's, uh, it's important for us to take away the fact that in these protracted crises, we have to find a way to work differently in uh, the nexus, right? And I think also donors expect that, and that may be one of the reasons why there have been some challenges, but it's a very complex question around uh, why the funding has uh, gone down. But, you know, for us, what we're advocating strongly for as FAO is, you know, the, the right type of mix of programming. We need to go big when it comes to emergency food aid interventions to tie acute families over in a lean season. We need to go big when it comes to ensuring that farming families have the seeds and the inputs they need to plant uh, in a cropping season. We need a, a, a much more nuanced uh, approach. We have uh, the skill sets, capacities analysis. We do this in many uh, contexts, but we're reliant on not just amounts of money, but money being given at the right points in time for particular crisis contexts. And so that's another key message I'd, I'd share in response to your question. Thank you. Uh, James? James Bays from Al Jazeera. Your report um, focuses on the very worrying situation, as you say, in some of these countries, 40 or so countries, and very severe situation in about five countries. What is your message, though, today to the biggest, richest countries? What do you say today to the G7, the G20? How urgent is this for them to do more? I think this is just an excellent question. I think this is uh, food insecurity around the world is exploding. Um, hunger is exploding. And if we don't address these issues, we end up paying, frankly, thousands of times more just a few years down the road. We have seen this happen after Syria crisis in Europe. We have seen this happen with Afghanistan. We have seen this happen with Central America and the US. We have seen this happen with Haiti and the US. So we need to have two types of solutions. One is absolutely now making sure that people don't starve. And then we need to think a little bit longer term where it is about rethinking our agricultural policies. It is about rethinking our energy policies so that we are not in a space like this ever again. 
I will also go and say that it is not about being self-sufficient in food, but it is certainly about being diversified in your food and in your energy. And I think this is one of the big lessons learned of this crisis. We need to make sure, I mean, if you, if you saw your own, let's say, investment portfolio, you would not buy one single asset or you would not buy, you know, one single stock in a particular asset. You will diversify. Why is our food not diversified enough? Why is our stocks not diversified enough and held by only a few countries? So when there is a shock, you feel that across the world. I think these are the big lessons which we need to address going forward so we are not in the same position again. And this, frankly, is not new. We were here in 2008 after the food and fuel crisis. Some things then would have happened, but they didn't happen. We were again there in 2011. Nothing happened. Maybe this is the third time, and hopefully we do something about it. But that would be the medium term. We need to deal with major short term saving people's lives and also then rethink our policies like i said thank you thanks uh edward um, oh sorry mr paulson so, sorry just just one quick statement i uh if if the question is what's the message to the g7 and others i would simply say that uh, the example of what was possible in response to the covid 19 pandemic i think is compelling we need to put the same energy collectively that we put into addressing the COVID-19 pandemic into addressing acute hunger. That's simply stated. The amounts of resources that were mobilized and the way in which new mechanisms, new structures, new solutions were put in place tells us that we can do this. It's about uh, political will and focus. Let's use that example uh, to address acute hunger. Thank you. Uh, Edward? Hi, this is Edward from China Central Television. Uh, this question is for, uh, for both for Mr. Hussein and uh, Mr. Posen. Uh, first, do, do, do you have any data of, of how much of the uh, normal agricultural activities are, uh, has been interrupted uh, in the Ukraine by, because of the conflict and what that could mean? And secondly, uh, how would, how would the, the Ukraine conflict affect the export of the Russian agricultural products and what, what, what would be the effect for the world um, food supply? Thank you. Let me let me just take it one by one. Um, as you know, Russia and Ukraine, they are in top of exporters of wheat, of corn, and of uh, sunflowers, oil seeds, basically. Uh, what we so that's that's the first part the second part is that there is not much grain or 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 commodities coming out of ukraine there are commodities coming out of russia but they are coming up out at a much higher cost meaning trade cost so this is why what you're, when you look at this problem from the consumer side, it costs a lot more now because of this crisis than it cost before this crisis. So now put yourself in a position where in a low income country or low, lower middle income country where you were, let's say, spending 50% of your income or more on food. And suddenly you got your, your food got more expensive. This is what we are seeing in many parts of the, of, of the world as we speak. One other thing which is really important, we talk about food, high food prices, which affects people. We talk about high fuel prices, which affects everybody. But don't forget high fertilizer prices. And why is fertilizer so important? because it has consequences for the next agricultural season. Right now, it's not a production problem, it is a access affordability problem. But if there is not enough fertilizer, if there is not enough other agricultural inputs, come next season, it would be availability 
end affordability problem. Maybe just in the interest of time, let me say, um, uh, if you go to the FAO website, there's a dedicated page uh, on um, uh, the war in Ukraine and implications, and there's updated analysis there on uh, the food security situation in the country, um, uh, as well as analysis on global implications uh, too. So I just refer you to, uh, to that analysis, please. Thank you very much. Uh, Arul? So Arul Lewis from IANS. Uh, you said that the Ukrainian crisis has uh, exacerbated the food crisis or the, food, the global food security situation overall. Uh, India has a huge surplus of uh, wheat uh, amounting to tens of uh, millions of tons. Uh, are any of your organizations doing anything to uh, utilize more of the stockpile? And a second question related to that is the, the World Trade Organization has uh, put restrictions on how much India can uh, export. Would you uh, think that those rules should be suspended in the current emergency? Thanks. Okay, so, so all I can tell you is that we are, uh, we are, we are in, in, uh, in discussions with India on, 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 uh, on procurement of wheat. Uh, so, so that is something which is, which is ongoing. And also that uh, one of the recommendations, whether it is uh, it is uh, uh, World Food Program or IMF or World Bank or even World, also World Trade Organization, is about exemption of uh, World Food Program from uh, export bans. Uh, and this is something, there was a press release on this only a couple of weeks ago, uh, where, where uh, these, uh, these organizations, they, they, have, they are encouraging governments not to put export bans, not to put things like that, which then artificially increase the, 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 the price and availability or, or reduce the availability of major staple commodities. So this is something which is a very big recommendation and uh, and hopefully uh, countries are listening. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I don't know all right. Particular to add on. Okay. Uh, so sorry. Were you were you making a response? No, sorry. I, no, uh, to say I don't have anything in particular to add on this, okay. but but the analysis around availability of commodities in different countries is, uh, and I've factored into the analysis I referred to on the FA website. But it's an area that sits uh, a little bit outside of my direct area of responsibility. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, last question, Ibtisam. Thank you, Farhan. Uh, thank you for the briefing. My name is Ibtisam uh, Azim from Al Arabi Al Jadid newspaper. I have two follow ups. The first one about. You said that the uh, commodities that are coming out of Russia uh, are higher now. Uh, so my question is, uh, b what's the reason behind that? Is it, uh, does it have to do with the fact that the Russians raised the prices or the sanctions or both? Or uh, uh, what uh, exactly behind that? And then the second question about the issue of free thinking, the agriculture map. Um, and uh, so my question is, how long would it take from the process of free thinking to actually uh, in, um, change, ha seeing and starting to uh, make some change uh, in this regard? Thank you. Uh, let me just, just correct that. Uh, no, I didn't, uh, what I said was that there are commodities which are coming out of Russia. Uh, but the, the the freight costs are higher than they used to be. Um, so, but from Ukraine side, there's not much coming out at all. That's what I was saying. Uh, I didn't. I'm sorry. I didn't get your second second question. Uh, yeah. No. Sure. Um, so, the, you talked about the fact that we need to um, rethink the way the. Uh, commodities and the agriculture goods are contributed and uh, where are they and how um, uh, and the, the question is uh, and you talked about the fact that there was a um, uh, problems in 2008 and then uh, about two years later and nothing has changed uh, or not much 
and maybe now for the third time uh, there will be some changes. The question is, yeah. from that process until you start having changes, and who needs to make the change, uh, government or etc. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, India, exactly that's what I said. And basically what I was saying is that, yes, it is the governments. Uh, how we, how you know, um, we, we need to, to make sure that our, 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 our food supplies are sufficiently diversified. So when there is some kind of a, a bottleneck um, or some time of a crisis, uh, the, the consequences of that are not as devastating as we see right now. That's what I was saying. Thank you. Noon, the 9,027th meeting of the Security Council is called to order. The provisional agenda for this meeting is maintenance of peace and security of Ukraine. The agenda is adopted. I would like to take this opportunity to thank on behalf of the council, Ambassador Barbara Woodward, permanent representative of the United Kingdom for her service as president of the council for the month of April. I would like to express the council's appreciation to Ambassador Woodward and her team for the skill with which they conducted the Council's business last month. Thank you, Barbara. In accordance with Rule 37 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I invite the representatives of Germany, Greece, Italy, Latvia, Poland, Slovakia, and Ukraine to participate in this meeting. It is so decided. On behalf of the Council, I welcome His Excellency, Mr. Piotr Glinski, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Culture and National Heritage of Poland. In accordance with Rule 39 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I invite the following briefers to participate in this meeting. Mr. Martin Griffiths, Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator. Ms. B Michelle Bachelet, United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. And Ms. Tatiana Luzan, Advocacy Coordinator right to protection. It is so decided. Mr. Griffiths, Ms. Bachelet, and Ms. Luzon are joining today's meeting via video teleconference. The Secretary General will now begin its, sorry, the Security Council will now begin its consideration of item two on the agenda. And I wish to warmly welcome the Secretary General, His Excellency, Mr. Antonio Guterres, and give him the floor. Madam President, Excellencies, I welcome this opportunity to address the Security Council on my recent visit to the Russian Federation and Ukraine, where I met with President Putin and President Zelensky on the 26th and the 28th of April, respectively. As part of my regional visit, I also had discussions with President Erdogan in Ankara and President Duta in Rzeszow, Poland. Throughout my travels, I did not mince words. I said the same thing in Moscow as I did in Kyiv, which is exactly what I have repeatedly expressed in New York. Namely that Russia's invasion of Ukraine is a violation of its territorial integrity and of the Charter of the United Nations, and that it must end for the sake of the people of Ukraine, Russia, and the entire world. Madam President, I visited Moscow and Kyiv with a clear understanding of the realities on the ground. 
I entered an active war zone in Ukraine with no immediate possibility of a national ceasefire and a full-scale ongoing attack on the east of the country. Before the visit, the Ukrainian government issued an appeal to the United Nations and to me personally, expressed publicly by the Deputy Prime Minister, regarding the dire plight of civilians in the devastated city of Mariupol and specifically the Azovstal plant. In my meeting with President Putin, I therefore stress the imperative enabling humanitarian access and evacuations from besieged areas, including first and foremost Mariupol. I strongly urge the opening of a safe and effective humanitarian corridor to allow civilians to reach safety from the Azovstal plant. A short time later, I received confirmation of an agreement in principle. We immediately followed up with intense preparatory work with the International Committee of the Red Cross, ICRC, along with Russian and Ukrainian authorities. Our objective was to initially enable the safe evacuation of those civilians from the Azovstal plant and later the rest of the city in any direction they choose and to deliver humanitarian aid. I am pleased to report on some measure of success. Together, the United Nations and the ICRC are leading a humanitarian operation of great complexity, both politically and in terms of security. It began on 29 April and has required enormous coordination and advocacy with the Russian Federation and the Ukrainian authorities. So far, two safe passage convoys have been successfully completed. In the first, concluded on 3 May, 109 civilians were evacuated from the Azovstal plant along with 59 more from a neighboring area. In the second operation, completed last night, more than 320 civilians were evacuated from the city of Mariupol and surrounding areas. A third operation is underway, but it is our policy not to speak about the details of any of them before they are completed to avoid undermining possible success. It is good to know that even in these times of hyper-communications, silent diplomacy is still possible and is sometimes the only effective way to produce results. So far in total, nearly 500 civilians found, found long-awaited awaited relief after living under relentless shelling and scarce availability of water, food and sanitation. The evacuees have shared moving tales with UN staff. Mothers, children and frail grandparents spoke of their trauma. Some were in urgent need of medical attention. I hope that the continued coordination with Moscow and Kyiv will lead to more humanitarian pauses to allow civilians safe passage from the fighting and aid to reach those in critical needs. We must continue to do all we can to get people out of these hellscapes. And the Secretary General and the Emergency Relief Coordinator Martin Griffith will brief you today in greater detail on the latest efforts in Mariupol and additional steps. I commission Bachelet will brief on reports of violations of international humanitarian and human rights law, possible war crimes, and the need for accountability. As I discussed yesterday with President Zelensky, the UN will continue to scale up humanitarian operations, save lives, and reduce suffering. Madam President, my meetings with both leaders also focused on the crucial issue of global food security. And indeed, the worldwide implications of this war were in full view in my subs sub subsequent travels to West Africa. In Senegal, Niger and Nigeria, I heard direct testimony from leaders and civil society on how the war is unleashing a food security crisis. We need quick and decisive action to ensure a steady flow of food and energy in open markets, by lifting export restrictions, allocating surpluses and reserves to those who need them, and addressing food price increase to calm market volatility. But let me be clear, a meaningful solution to global food insecurity requires reintegrating Ukraine's agricultural production and the food and fertilizer production of Russia and Belarus into world markets despite the war. I will do my best to help facilitate a dialogue to help make this a reality. At the same time, 
The war in Ukraine in all its dimensions is setting in motion a crisis that is also devastating global energy markets, disrupting financial systems, and exacerbating extreme vulnerabilities for the developing world. That is precisely what I established, why I established the Global Crisis Response Group on Food, Energy, and Finance to mobilize UN agencies, multilateral development banks, and other international institutions to help countries face these challenges. We were particularly engaged in making proposals at the spring meetings of the IMF and the World Bank. Madam President, Excellencies, the war on Ukraine is senseless in scope, restless in its dimensions, and limitless in its potential for global harm. The cycle of death, destruction, dislocation, and disruption must stop. It is high time to unite and end this war, and I thank you. I thank the Secretary General for his briefing. I now give the floor to Mr. Martin Griffiths. Linda, Madam President, thank you very much indeed. Um, as we've just heard from the Secretary General, elements of diplomatic progress are coming into view even as civilian suffering mounts. So I'll speak briefly today, if I may, about the human toll of this war and then about what we're doing to address humanitarian needs, including a short update date on our latest operations. And I know that High Commissioner Bachelet will, of course, detail the impact on civilians for you, so I will be brief. Just to recap, the destruction of civilian infrastructure has come to characterize this conflict. Apartment buildings, schools, and hospitals in populated areas have been attacked, and they must not be so. Over 13 million Ukrainians have been forced to flee their homes, of whom 7.7 .7 million are displaced inside Ukraine. Lives have been uprooted, ripped apart, and never will be the same again. And many others couldn't run. Often the most vulnerable are simply stuck. The elderly, people with disabilities, have been unable to seek shelter from bombs, get out to gather supplies, or receive information on evacuations. And the threat of gender-based violence, including conflict-related sexual violence, sexual exploitation and abuse, and human trafficking, as I'm sure we will hear from the other briefers, risen hugely since the war began. Allegations of sexual violence against women, girls, men, and boys are mounting. Roads, as we've all seen, are heavily contaminated with explosive ordnance, putting civilians at risk, and stopping humanitarian convoys from reaching them. Madam President, let me briefly brief you what the UN and our humanitarian partners are trying to do inside Ukraine to meet these growing needs. We have about 217 humanitarian partners with whom we are working in Ukraine. And I think we have now scaled up at record speed. We have more than 1,400 staff, UN staff, deployed across the country Operating out, operating out of eight hubs beyond Kyiv, with staff, warehouses, and supplies in 30 locations, principally, of course, across the east, where the war is happening and the needs are greatest. We reach more than 4.1 million people with some form of assistance on a daily basis across all the country's 24 oblasts. Our humanitarian response has three main aspects. First, we deliver a great deal of humanitarian assistance and protection services to displaced people, and I know it's not enough, and I'm sure it's adequate, and I know we'll hear more on that. But that's all across the country, especially where internally displaced people have sought safety, or where people begin have begun returning, a crucial, crucial new element to severely damaged communities. And when I was in Irpin just a few weeks ago, the mayor was describing to us as he, I think, described to the Secretary General, how he, his people are trying to get back to Irpin, but to, to do so, the reconstruction will take, as he's put it, a year and a half. So restoring basic services necessary to survive is key. And I was very struck by the fact that the International Committee of the Red Cross, very, very quickly after the conversation I'd had, but not as a result of that, went in to repair the basic services element for the population of Irpin to be able to return. In these areas, injecting cash aid allows civilians to choose what they need 
and offers a modicum of dignity in these precious times. It helps to keep markets open and liquidity and supply chains moving. We plan to reach 1.3 million people with cash assistance. Plugging into Ukraine's social protection system with top-up payments, working with the government, working with the Prime Minister and his plans for the distribution of cash to his people to reach family at risk. This is needed technically aid on, but it's now largely achieved. Cash-based aid will now scale up uh, very, very quickly indeed. A second part, that's the first part. The second part of our response is working on pre-positioning supplies to forward operating bases and increasing our preparedness in areas to where we think, we imagine this war might move next. And third, and we've heard from the Secretary General, we engage every single day with parties to the conflict to push for the movement of aid to civilians in areas of active conflict or to negotiate to help civilians leave for safer areas. We have been able, Madam President, so far to stage five interagency aid convoys to some of the hardest hit areas. Operations which required a humanitarian notification system to both parties to allow for those safe passage movements. They've been a lifeline, a small mercy perhaps, to civilians encircled by fighting, bringing in medical supplies, water, food rations, non-food items, and so forth. But it's a beginning, but hopefully it's not an end. And as the Secretary General has described as a result of his own efforts, we've seen a glimmer of hope in these past days, thanks to his efforts and those of our colleagues uh, on the front line. As you know, on May the 2nd, more than 100 civilians were evacuated from the Azovstal plant in Mariupol, including women, children, and older people. About 60 more people joined that convoy on the outskirts of Mariupol and were then able to move to safety. And it was, as the Secretary General has described, a, a, a project of the greatest complexity and of constant, constant oversight. And it was an exceptional operation. I'm especially grateful, I'd like to record here our thanks to the International Committee of the Red Cross and the leadership of Peter Mara, as well as to our own highly, highly experienced first responders. But I must also applaud the authorities and it's essentially the respective militaries of both Ukraine and the Russian Federation for their close and constructive and essential cooperation in making that operation a reality. It showed us that that can happen. And I believe, though the numbers weren't great, that a single life saved is worth every ounce of effort. And as of yesterday, as the Secretary General said, we were able to move more than 320 civilians out of the Mariupol area broadly, again working closely in, in lockstep with ICRC and with the cooperation of the Ukrainian and the Russian authorities. And today we have that third operation which began this morning with the intent of evacuating civilians, civilians from Mariupol and Azovstal. And as he said, we prefer not to speak about that operation until it is complete. What I can finally say about this is we're seeing the fruits of our labor over these past many weeks of establishing a liaison in, in Moscow of the visits that preceded the Secretary General and which were brought into fruition by his own long and detailed meetings with the leaderships of both sides in this last week. We are beginning to see now the agreement on local ceasefires, because none of these movements of safe passage will happen without local ceasefires, pauses, windows of silence. So we're making some progress and we're building relations and we're building experience, which we hope we can then broaden uh, to more such operations. And that is the third element of our humanitarian program. We'll keep pushing for more civilians to be able to leave Mariupol and indeed Azovstal if they say true choose. And we will now begin on that basis to explore options for reaching others where the need is greatest and where we need and desire to serve the people of Ukraine in their hour of direst need. Madam President, thank you very much. I thank Mr. Griffiths for his briefing. I now give the floor to Ms. Michelle Bachelet. Madam President, Excellencies, 
For over eight years, since 15 March 2014, my office through the Human Rights Monitoring Mission in Ukraine has been monitoring the situation in Ukraine. To date, we have released close to 50 periodic and thematic reports. On the 24th of February 2022, we quickly adapted to a very different working environment. Like millions of Ukrainians, the staff of my office relocated to other regions in the country, but, and I'm very proud to say, have not paused their work for a single day. Currently, the mission has staff on the ground in Uzgorod, Kyiv, Lviv, Dnipro, Donetsk, and Odessa, and conducts uh, field visits to various parts of the country, including Kyiv and Chernihiv region just last week. The mission continues to verify allegations of violations of international human rights law and of international humanitarian law in the context of the Russian Federation's armed attack on Ukraine. Many of these allegations concern violations that may amount to war crimes. Based on the mission work, my office updated the UN Human Rights Council at the end of March and will present a report on the human rights situation in Ukraine covering the period from 24 February to 15 May at the next session of the Council in June. And my press statement on Ukraine on the 22nd of April summarized our most recent findings. It pains me to say that our, all our concerns remain valid and the situation keeps deteriorating. Madam President, today is the 71st day of the escalation of the hostilities, expanding the already eight year long conflict to all regions of the country. Reports of deadly incidents, such as attacks on hospital number three and the drama theater in Mariupol, on the railway station in Kramatorsk, on residential areas in Odessa have become shockingly frequent. There seems to be no end in sight to the daily reports of civilian death and injuries. My team on the ground conveys the palpable trauma and shock experienced by people they speak with, the mass majority of whom have either personally witnessed a violation or are victims themselves. Rather than try to describe what victims are going through, let me use their words. Residents of Mariupol set up a telegram channel to share information about their relatives who perished in the city. And I will quote them. He was killed in front of his wife and children. Her body remained under the debris of her house. We could not even bury her. My uncle died from loss of blood after sustaining fragmentation injuries. I only know he was buried in a collective grave. I could share many more such messages. Last week on the 28th of April, when the UN Secretary General was visiting Kyiv to meet the President of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky, the city was hit by two missiles. At least one woman, a journalist, was killed and four civilians were injured in the attack. An OSCHR team was in Kyiv on that day too, preparing to visit Busha. On the same day, we corroborated 22 civilian deaths and 40 civilian injuries in other places of Ukraine. Members of the council in Ukraine, my office has recorded 6,731 civilian casualties since the, of the 24th of February. We know the real figures are considerably higher. As my office consistently reports, most of these casualties have been caused by the use of explosive weapons with wide area effects in populated areas, such as shelling from heavy artillery, incurring multiple launch rocket systems, missiles, and airstrikes. My office is also documenting the devastating consequences of the conflict on other human rights. In areas around Kyiv from late February for about five weeks, Russian forces targeted male civilians who they consider suspicious. Men that were detained, beaten, summarily executed and in some cases taken to Belarus and Russia, unbeknownst to their families and held in pre-trial detention facilities. My staff met with families who are searching for their missing male relatives, desperate to know where they are, if they are alive, or how they can get them back. Families were shot as, as they tried to escape in convoys. In some areas, it was dangerous to cross the street with snipers or soldiers shooting at anyone who tried. Local authorities are compiling lists of deaths and missing, continuing exhumations, taking DNA from relatives, while also trying to reconnect districts, districts to electricity and water. In other areas controlled by Russian armed forces and affiliated armed groups, such as Kharkiv, Donetsk, Luhansk, Saporizhia, and Kherson regions, we continue to document arbitrary detention and possible enforced disappearances of representatives of local authorities, journalists, civil society activists, retired servicemen, and the armed forces, 
another civilians by Russian armed forces and affiliated armed groups. As of 4th of May, my office has documented 180 such cases, of which five victims were eventually found dead. We have also documented eight possible enforced disappearances of people considered to be pro-Russian in government-controlled territory. My staff heard about cases of women having been raped by Russian armed forces in areas that were under their control, as well as other allegations of sexual violence by both parties to the conflict. And yet, the stigma around rape and sexual violence continues to prevent victims and their families from feeling safe to report. This only highlights the importance of ensuring adequate and safe support services for victims. Grim evidence of torture, ill treatment, and summary executions of prisoners of war committed by both parties to the conflict is surfacing. My office is collecting such evidence, which will be included in its future reporting. The only way for these horrors to stop is for armed forces to fully respect their obligations under international human rights law and international humanitarian law. It is vital that all parties give clear instruction to their combatants to protect civilians and persons or the, the combat, as well as to distinguish between civilian and military objects. Those in command of armed forces must make it clear to their members that anyone found to have been involved in such violations will be prosecuted and held accountable. Accountability demands that evidence be preserved and that mortal remains be treated with dignity, with decency. Madam President, members of the Council, the list of gross violations of international human rights law and serious violations of international humanitarian law continues to grow each day. And we cannot let the number of victims continue to rise. A one-day ceasefire alone would spare the lives of at least 50 civilian children, women and men, including many older persons. A one-day ceasefire would prevent 30 to 70 civilians from being injured and a dozen from, being, from becoming disabled. A one-day ceasefire would allow several thousand civilians to safely leave areas where they are currently trapped in hostilities. Most importantly, a ceasefire will show that the horror in Ukraine can be stopped. It is of the most fundamental importance that the ongoing hostilities cease once and for all. Madam President, advocating for accountability is a cornerstone of my office work. If the perpetrators of violations against civilians and persons or the combat are brought to justice, potential perpetrators will think twice before unleashing similar unlawful attacks or, at or acts of violence and creating new victims. Accountability also contributes to the healing process for the victims, the family and the society at large. National justice systems are the most crucial. I urge the parties to the conflict to investigate all violations of international human rights law and international humanitarian law allegedly committed by their armed forces. And I welcome Ukraine's effort in this regard. My office is fully committed to supporting those systems and the work of the Commission of Inquiry on Ukraine and to cooperating with the Office of the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court and other international justice mechanisms in accordance with our established UN frameworks. Let us commit to putting a stop to this senseless conflict. We must be steadfast in our efforts for peace and resolute that justice will be done. I thank you for your attention. I thank Ms. Bachelet for her briefing. I now give the floor to Ms. Tatiana Lazan. Thank you, Madam President. It is a great honor to represent today's civil society that mobilized the first hours after the full-scale Russian invasion of February 24, as they did before for eight years of the war. Our joint efforts are aimed at supporting brave Ukrainians fighting at the forefront, as well as in public offices in Lviv, Kiev, and Kramatorsk. These are volunteers, municipal workers planting flowers in Kharkiv and other cities in Ukraine under heavy shelling, railway workers evacuating people away from hostilities and death, bakers, cashiers at groceries, and all people affected by the war. All Ukrainians are now beating as one big heart. In the chaos of war, no one should be left behind. People, their lives and health, honor, dignity and security shall always remain the highest value. In order to maintain this goal, Ukraine and the whole civilized world shall face immense challenges 
caused by the military invasion of the Russian Federation. The war has been lasting for eight years. In 2021, the number of IDPs in Ukraine fleeing occupied territories of Crimea, Donetsk and Luhansk regions officially was almost 1.5 million. At the end of April, the International Organization for Migration informed that the number of internally displaced persons as a result of the full-scale invasion of the territory of Ukraine reached 7.7 .7 million. They all carried the same heavy burden of displacement. They all need equal protection. Also, should not be forgotten those Ukrainians who were forcibly dis displaced to the Russian Federation from Mariupol, Chernihiv, Severodonetsk, and other cities and villages. These people were forcibly displaced without documents and means of communication, exposed to the filtration by the Russian Federation. Within these two last months, over 1 million people overall, and around 200,000 children among them were forcibly displaced to the Russian Federation from Ukraine. It must be ensured that those who are willing to come back to Ukraine or travel to other countries have the possibility to do so. Challenges that children and their parents experience in the face of war are overwhelming. Right to protection received calls via our hotline where parents were ready to send their children abroad with complete strangers. Out of desperation because of the Russian atrocities, happening in Kharkiv, Mariupol, and other cities. The world was shaken with stories of little boys, aged even four or five, crossing the state border alone. Or in the best case scenario, with very familiar people. Ukraine, as well as accepting countries, shall resume responsibility over these vulnerable little Ukrainians, so that the children are safely crossing the state borders, supported by specifically trained state guard officers and child service representatives. The accepting countries shall guarantee a high level of their protection. Family reunification should be presumed, and they are safe and timely return to Ukraine of the, after the end of the war must be ensured. The number of killed and injured civilians is permanently increasing. The destinies of dozens of thousands of people in Mariupol, Kherson, Kharkiv, Chernihiv, Irpin are unknown. Relatives cannot always prove the death of their beloved, even if they witnessed their last moments themselves. International community shall assist the government of Ukraine in establishing and enforcing appropriate measures of investigation and prosecution, since each life is priceless and relatives deserves to know the truth. I want to mention those Ukrainians who have fled Ukraine seeking safety and security in the European Union and other countries in the civilized world. These Ukrainians, overwhelming majority, women and children, should not be overlooked in terms of observance of their rights, shelter, human trafficking, access to service, including psychological help. Stateless persons and third country nationals who had previously found refuge in Ukraine shall be granted protection along with the Ukrainians. Finally, of paramount importance is to recall the immense number of IDPs, many of whom may not have a roof over their heads. In many cases, the conditions of temporary accommodation do not comply with basic rules of adequate shelter. IDPs live in collective or transit centers established in schools, places of common use, often not designed for a state during cold times. Over 32 million square meters of housing property were destroyed, damaged, or occupied. Despite the massive destruction, as the whole world has seen in Bucha, Irpin, Chernihiv, Kharkiv, Thousands of civilians either returned back or never left their damaged homes. All of them urgently need adequate temporary or permanent accommodation, especially for the cold autumn and winter periods. Those who chose not to leave their damaged homes shall receive the much needed tangible support. 
such as the construction materials and tools, plastic wrap, and physical health. Additionally, such unprecedented massive destruction of civilian infrastructure requires durable solutions. From the Ukrainian authorities, with support of the international community. We call on all members of the Security Council, international organizations, and governments to support Ukrainians firmly in these dark times. In the name of millions of people who have died, unborn, survived residents of Ukraine, a UN member since 1945, we require to rephrase and brief new sense in the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights for living in peace. Thank you for your attention. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.